Sarah Silverman? She's known for saying the most offensive of things. Gross homeless guy? The things that come out of her mouth are comically twisted and harsh and intense. But there's something about Sarah Silverman that lets her get away with a lot. Burn the White House! If that were a different type of person or maybe a different type of guy, they would much more quickly alienate the audience. The combination of Sarah being adorable and crude is part of her success because it's so compelling. Still, controversy follows her everywhere. She's one of the most polarizing comedians of our time. It's the classic way that people misunderstand Sarah Silverman. They hear jokes that have controversial, you know, words in them. They think that she's being a racist. I don't care if you think I'm racist. I just want you to think I'm sin. I'm not looking to be pushing buttons or be talking about what's taboo. I just want to make people laugh, really. If she just broke convention and was dirty now and then, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about her. That's too easy. Sarah's uh, deeper than that. Sarah's more important than that. Nothing to lose. Leads you to where you are today. I believe in storytelling. It's gonna make you a star. I'm still trying to figure that out. In a world where it's increasingly hard to shock people, Sarah Silverman has shown a gift for the outrageous. But don't give me an award. It would cheapen it. Her Comedy Central series, The Sarah Silverman Program, manages to mix cutting edge humor with classic comedy. I'm gonna do something else important too. What? I'll give you two hints. It's yellow and it's pee pee. Her show is really special. It's a new kind of sitcom. It's fresh, it's, it's funny. There are moments that we haven't seen before. The word brunch comes from the Latin. I pooped. Every time there's a female comedian, everybody goes, oh, she's the next Lucille Ball. But I think it really applies mostly to Sarah, because with, with Lucy, she's in charge of that show. And Sarah's in charge of her show. One of the best things about being in charge is getting to pick who you work with. And you can learn a lot about Sarah and what's important to her by who she chose. Her real-life sister, Laura, her own dog, and some longtime friends, like comedian Brian Posehn. Whenever we're working on something, she wants to help out everybody that she knows. She's like, oh, I got a great guy that'll be good. This friend of mine, he needs some work. Let's put him in there. I'm basically playing a gay version of myself. A video game playing, heavy metal loving, a uh, guy who doesn't like to leave the house, and that's me. She's at the stage of her career, she could go with anybody, you know? She could grab anybody, but friends are first. It's perhaps one of the easiest acting jobs I've ever had. Sarah's also playing a version of herself on the show, perhaps confusingly also named Sarah Silverman. It's hardly a flattering self-portrait. Sarah Jane Anastasia Silverman, you are the most selfish, racist, manipulative, lazy, pompous human being alive today. She comes across, you know, on the show qu quite deliberately as um, an idiot. She plays just the ultimate narcissistic nightmare. But as she told me, she's someone who thinks she's doing the right thing. My dad was just diagnosed with liver cancer. Oh my God, that's so bizarre. You guys, my remote needs batteries. Everybody be careful, these things happen in threes. When her character says things that are outrageous and selfish and cruel, the audience often confuses that character with Sarah the person. That character, Sarah's alter ego, with an emphasis on the ego part, is a comic personality she started developing when she was just two years old. We felt like we just like won the jackpot. She was so cute and so vulgar. Sarah Kate Silverman was born on December 1st, 1970 in Manchester, New Hampshire. Her parents, Beth Ann and Donald, were very much children of the 60s. We were suburban hippies. We did all the, the regular suburban things. We had a station wagon and um, a, a nice house, but our attitude toward life was of the kind of free-thinking 
uh, persuasion. One of Sarah's father's free-thinking ideas was about language, and particularly about swearing. We swore a lot. Like, my father swears all the time. I mean, every swear came out of his mouth when we were kids. It was not a problem. Her first words were, bastard, damn Taught to obey? Me! She was like two or three, and she would sit on my father's lap and say, bastard, damn and then people came to visit and they'd all, everyone would gather around and she was so cute with this little monkey face and this short little like thick black hair and these giant brown eyes and she'd say, bastard damn and we would roar. Sarah always liked being in the spotlight. When Sarah's parents told six-year-old Sarah and her older sisters, 13-year-old Susan and 11-year-old Laura, they were getting divorced, Sarah got upset, but not for the obvious reason. When my parents sat down to tell us that they were going to separate, the older sisters became very upset and we started to cry and Sarah was doing a dance on the floor and she started to cry and we said, oh Sarah, Sarah, it'll be okay. And she said, no, I'm dancing and nobody's watching me. <laughs> That's why she was crying. <laughs> Sarah got used to being watched at a very early age. She started acting in community theater when she was five and starred in Annie before she was a teenager. I didn't know she could sing well until she auditioned for Annie when she was 11. I, I had never heard her belt out a song. Bye bye, Mama. You can rock me anymore. So long, Daddy. You see, I'm walking out the door. Please understand that it's nothing you have done. But shortly after Sarah turned 13, all her energy and spirit seemed to drain away into a severe depression that would haunt her and her family for years. Sarah started to get depressed after the divorce, and I think that was maybe a kind of a, a, a delayed reaction to what was going on. She actually had uh, panic attacks when she was a freshman in high school and was out of school for three or four months. She used to say then, I feel like I'm homesick, but I'm home. She couldn't figure out the feeling of, of homesickness or of sort of a scary kind of separation when she have some moment of an extreme rupture with society almost and a wound and I think that that period probably is that for her. After missing most of 10th grade, Sarah's parents finally enrolled her at the Dairyfield School, a small independent school with only 50 kids in Sarah's entire class. At first, it didn't make much of a difference. Our father had to like, force her into the car and force her to school. In the first couple of days, you know, was kicking and screaming, and I'll never forgive you for this. Anytime somebody is in a depression, the people who love that person worry that they're not gonna come out of it. It's hard to see the end of the tunnel. But eventually it passed. She had really successful years in high school once she, once she sort of settled into herself. Sarah ended up starring in all the plays at Derryfield and played varsity athletics in three sports. She also fell in love for the first time with her history teacher, Bruce Burke. She just loved him so much. She was in love with him. When she was a junior in high school, I, I got engaged to get married. We had something called all school assemblies on Mondays and Sarah got up and made a speech about how her life would never be the same uh, because I had promised myself to another girl. She used to jokingly plot the demise of his wife. <laughs> I think she was joking. <laughs> she didn't date, didn't have boyfriends. This was a great substitute for a boyfriend. All the girl, uh, girlish crushes and the, the beating heart, you know, and, and every, all of the, the, the sweet nothings she could say to, to these men who were un, untouchable, you know, unattainable safe. Sarah may not have been ready for a real relationship, but she was ready to take on the real world. At 17, she knew exactly what she wanted from life. I want to be a comedian and an actor and a player. When 17-year-old Sarah was a senior in high school, she decided she was ready to try stand-up for the first time. She was too nervous to perform in front of her family, so she invited her high school heartthrob, Mr. Burke, to make the hour drive with her from New Hampshire to Boston. It was the middle of the afternoon. I, I, if there were four people in the place, I don't know. It felt like a club, a strip club in the middle of the afternoon. There was nobody there. 
Uh, Sarah comes out, she comes out stage, she walks up to the mic, this very cute little New Hampshire girl. And the first 20 words are <laughs> And then she smiles and she says, I've always wanted to do that in public. That was Sarah. And she was gonna shock people from day one. But Sarah was about to find out that in the comedy world of New York City, shocking people wasn't enough. The rejection was really hard for her to take and she lost her confidence and took a really long time for her to feel brave enough to sort of go out there again.